Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, we really appreciate you coming and um, loving your community enough to learn about it and to see what we can do to make it even better. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, as you know, Jefferson County Public Schools is requiring masks. Um, the speakers up in front will not be wearing masks during their presentations so that you can tell what they're saying. Um, but uh, the rest of us will have to keep our masks on. Um, a very, very special thanks to Christy and Tiffany for their community support of tonight's meeting. They are with Remax Alliance, and you have it on your, your handout at the bottom. So thank you, Christy and Tiffany. And then also to Sharon Terrell of My Mountain Town. Sharon is doing the video taping, and um, in the next day or so, we'll get a Get the link out for the video and you can watch it again or any of your neighbors that aren't here um, can certainly take a look also. So our speakers tonight have been asked um, to present just the facts, no opinions, um, and um, to support, you know, not in support of uh, or opposition to any development, person, anything like that. So you know the drill probably. Um, most of you have been here many times. If there's anyone that hasn't, what we do is we have presentations from 7 to about 8 o'clock. And then at that point, you have a chance to talk to the presenters, ask your questions, whatever. So um, no, no comments or questions during any of the presentations. So what is going on around here? First of all, um, we have a Chamber of Commerce update, and Brittany LaRue, who is our new director, was unable to be here tonight, um, but in her place is Sharon Trilk, and she's going to be giving an update on the Chamber. Sharon. Good evening, everyone. I hope this cold weather is getting you all in a festive spirit because we have our 38th annual Con for Christmas Parade coming up. It's going to be on December 4th along Sutton Road as usual. And we're going to be starting at 10.30 a.m. this time with some music. And of course, Santa is coming in on the Elk Creek Fire Big Bird engine starting right at 10.30. So bring your kids. Elk Creek Fire will be presenting Santa Land once again. So you can come and enjoy some hot chocolate and treats and get photos with Santa, we're hoping, and uh, have them tell all their wishes to get presents for Christmas. Uh, we're going to have some music this year, Conquer Jazz Band, and others that are going to kick off the parade in the beginning. And then the parade starts at 2 o'clock, so make sure you're there before then along the road. We have over 30 already signed up to be in our parade. We're also going to have two spirits tents this year. So in East and the West, like we do an elevation celebration and a VIP tent. So if you're interested in tickets there, we'll have some heaters in. Can't guarantee how warm it'll be, but at least a little bit of warmth. And you'll be up on a raised platform to watch the parade go by. So we're going to have mark Christmas markets again. We'll have vendors there so you can shop local and help support our small businesses. And then we're having an after party. So we're going to have more music afterwards. So please stick around and enjoy the festivities and shopping and drinks and fun with your community. And in addition to the Conifer Christmas Parade, I also want to mention that we are doing our Light Up Conifer contest again this year for businesses and residents. So if you are interested in getting your house decorated and being on our map and then being in the contest to win prizes with your Christmas or holiday decorations, go ahead and go to the Conifer Chamber website to get signed up for that and we'll get you added on to that. Um, we've got directories in the back if you didn't get one in the mail, so pick one of those up because that's going to have your list of all those local businesses that you want to use in our area for anything that you need. And be sure to shop local again this whole Christmas season and let your neighbors know all the fun things that you've done. If you have any questions, I'll be in the back. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. And next we have um, Christy Seaborn, who is Contra Area Council Vice President of our board, and she's going to do um, an update of um, RTD bus routes and others, and also an update about the Salvation Army. Christy.
Good evening. Um, as Shirley said, I'm Christy Seaborn, and I'd just like to share a couple things with you. Um, first, we want to make sure that you all know that there are bus routes up and running on 285 again. Bus staying, which is an inner city bus service, service that started in 2015, makes a stop in Pine Junction at 10 or 5 a.m. heading into Denver, and again at 2.35 at coming back up the hill. RTD's schedule picks up at multiple stops, uh, with earlier times going down into Denver and later times coming back on Monday through Friday. You can find the specific times online, and we will also be sending out a link in our email with the playback for tonight's town hall meeting. Secondly, I want to talk to you briefly about Salvation Army's Conifer Unit. Our unit has been in the area since the 80s, and we service the 285 corridor from Indian Hills up to Kenosha Pass. 90% of the donations stay in the area, and all of uh, the people working in our group are volunteers. We receive requests directly from people that are facing struggles, as well as from local agencies and utility companies that are made aware of needs. We have provided meals, paid utility bills, helped with car repairs, medical costs, Christmas gifts, rent, and more. Uh, all of the funds we bring in are collected during our bell ringing between Thanksgiving and Christmas. This is the only time of the year that we bring in money, and without a means of additional support, you can imagine this is of utmost importance to our community. So if you can spare a couple of hours to ring the bell, we would really appreciate it. We do have um, means of signing up in the back, and um, we will also be sending out a link for that with uh, the email. Thanks so much. Thanks, Christy. Um, and next we have um, Public Relations Manager Jessica Paulson um, is going to talk about what's going on at our Conifer Library. Jessica. Hi everyone, it's good to see you again. Um, I'm the manager of Conifer Library here. Um, just wanted to let you know that the school has informed us that they're hoping the front door construction will be finished by the end of the year. So hopefully we can start using that again soon. Um, JCPL has just recently rolled out a brand new service um, to circulate Chromebooks for job seekers in the community. So if you know, know anyone who needs uh, a device at home for any reason, um, please check out those Chromebooks. Our holiday program is coming up on December 9th at 6 p.m. It's called Christmas Out West, and it's going to be um, all about the celebrations of Christmas in the Old West. So please check that out. And then just a reminder that all of our family story times are Saturdays at 10, 15 a.m. We'll hope to see you there. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. And next, um, we have Sarah Opperl, who is, and I probably didn't say that, right? <laughs> she can tell, what, tell you what it really sounds like. Um, okay, it's kind of her area council board member and also the trails team co-chair, Sarah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, it's really uh, tried to say. My name is Sarah Opperly, um, part of the Trails Committee. So just really quickly, is a plea to fill out our Trails survey. You guys might have seen it posted on Nextdoor by a couple of our members. Um, we try to post it every couple of weeks to make sure that we're reaching a bigger audience. Um, it's also going to be posted on our website, on the main screen, and on the Trails um, link there where you can find out more information. Um, it's mostly just so we can get a good idea of what you guys, um, as members of our community, are interested in for trails, what's your priority, and, and where you would like them to be. So that's it. You see the survey, please take it. Oh, we appreciate it. Thanks, Sarah. And um, next, um, Heather Bufferless is normally here with planning and zoning, Jeffco planning and zoning, um, and she does a PowerPoint about all of the different cases going on in the Conifer area. She was unable to make it tonight, and um, like everyone else at the county, they are losing people, and so they don't have enough staff. So she wasn't able to make it, and neither was anybody else from the county tonight. Um, but she did go ahead and do a PowerPoint for us, and um, Conifer Area Council Board Member Susie Nelson is going to present that. So, Susie. Thank you. 
That's not easy to do. Good evening, and bear with me. I've never done a PowerPoint before, but this is not going to be too long, so I think we'll be okay. Um, this is an update on what's going on in planning and zoning since the last Hanford Area Council meeting. This is a more abbreviated update than usual. There, we're just going to touch on the cases that are of, with the most community interest. The one new pre-application is a request for a three-lot commercial subdivision in the Conifer Business Center near 285 and Pleasant Park Road. The land uses are already in place and they want to develop under those. So there is no slide on this proposal, um, but it is item number eight in the land use cases list so that you were provided uh, at the door. So uh, check on number eight. Uh, the case manager is listed and can be contacted if there are any questions or concerns. A rezoning is when someone wants to change the allowed uses on the property. There are four points throughout the process where there is public notification at the time of community meeting, formal application, and at the two public hearings. Testimony can be given at either the Planning Commission or the Board of County Commissioners hearing. And the Board of County Commissioners has the final decision. Planning Commission hearing was scheduled for this, but the applicant requested a continuance to work out some outstanding issues on the case. We have identified this property as, I think it's on Kitty Drive behind the old Safeway Center, you know, where Staples is. So it's right there at the junction of uh, 73 and 285. Okay, the applicant is still trying to resolve some issues on this property. Um, there was, is this the one where, no, no, that's another one. So there, uh, they've asked for, uh, no, that's not right. The applicant is still trying to resolve outstanding issues. That's all we have for that. Land use cases sheet says 45.37 acres, but that's only the, only the acreage on the Mary's Drive parcel. The Apache Trail parcel is another 10 acres. Okay. The uses are already established on this. It's in the comprehensive master plan. Uh, doesn't apply to this uh, parcel. How a larger property is divided, there'll be formal application, it'll go to the Planning Commission, and then the Board of County Commissioners. That's how the subdivision plan works. Um, Case manager contact information was on each of the slides. Uh, please reach out to them if you have any questions or comments on these cases. And it's included with the handouts. And thank you very much. Thank you, Susie. Um, and you have all of the information in your packet of all of the all of the cases that are going um, that are with the county right now. So um, you have all the contact information, so you can call in anything you need to. So the next um, speaker um, didn't get on the agenda. That was my fault. Um, but some of you may um, believe that. It is the most important topic, and that is water resources up here. So John Wallach, who is um, our Water Resources Study Action Team co-chair, is going to give an update on their findings um, for the um, Water Resources Study Action Team. John.
My name is John Lollick. Is that kind of true, all right? Uh, that would be better. Uh, can I uh, give you the summary of where we've been with our uh, water uh, study action team? Uh, focus this. Uh, as an overview, as an overview to uh, uh, the conifer uh, general layout, uh, the, the activity center contains uh, 377 wells in four centralized systems. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, uh, we've got Aspen Park Metro District up by King Supers. Conifer Metro District uh, is at Safeway. And uh, CSA is down at Staples. CSA uh, actually pipes their. Uh, that flowing down to CMD, and they use their water treatment plant and send the water back up to CSA, where they release it right across from that uh, Stinker uh, Sinclair station. So just to give you a layout, this is 285, and that's that Sinclair station. CMD is the uh, Safeway, and APMD is uh, King Supers. Uh, our focus has been on total dissolved solids this year. Uh, total dissolved solids are a, what's called a secondary uh, contaminant. They're not known to present health hazards, but it's all aesthetic. It's going to clog the water. Uh, it, it, uh, it's going to uh, cor corrode pipes, increase the hardness of the water, staining, and so on. And uh, the TDS levels in conifer have been uh, rising. Uh, the normal, the state or US wide level for TDS is 500 milligrams per liter. And uh, here in conifer, they're using a 400 milligram per liter limit for the uh, metro districts because they're putting it down into the groundwater that people pump directly up to use. Uh, the the uh, TDS comes from the water moving over the, the ground and going down through the rocks, dissolving minerals. It's also uh, from human activity, everything from waste to uh, uh, the shampoos and soaps and everything that goes down the drain contributes to TDS. So, uh, normal TDS would run about 175. To four and a quarter of drinking water. The uh, TDS five year history on the two metro districts, Conifer Metro District and Aspen Park Metro District, are well above the, uh, the 400 millimeter or milligram per liter uh, limit. And what's troubling us is that trends are going up. And so that's why we focused on this year. We wanted to know the extent of this uh, TDS. Is it just around certain areas or not? Uh, the composition of TDS is real important. Uh, they looked at the composition, and it's, they didn't find any health-related issues. This is composition of the TDS from Conifer Metro District. And it's really 40% uh, chloride. Uh, this summer, uh, July, September, actually November, it seemed like summer, uh, three times uh, Peter Bartman and I went around, monitored 14 locations in town here to see what the TDS levels were. We measured cross section of the flow, estimated flow rates. And uh, these are the levels we're reading around town. If you can see this uh, first column here, 
most of them are above the uh, limit. And uh, the ones where the uh, the uh, CSA effluent after being processed and commingled with CMP's effluent, uh, these are the highest readings at 1769. Uh, if you take the uh, contaminant level and flow rates, you can estimate the loads. In other words, how many pounds of contaminant per day we're putting down the uh, North and South Turkey Creek. Uh, at uh, Lion J main entrance, uh, we're estimating 400 pounds per day, and at the uh, South Turkey Creek Road, we're at 300 pounds, 320 pounds per day. So we're going to keep monitoring this and try to see if we can get the right groups together to try to address either leveling off these uh, trends or dropping them if possible. That's the same information, just with weighted lines. And so the conclusion here is uh, the water team is going to keep monitoring TDS. Levels are way above the limits and going up. And uh, CMD is currently in the process of getting a variance from their 400 milliliter per milliliter liter limit. It turns out Aspen Park Metro District has also had that variance for these several years, and until you dig a fair bit, you can't really see that data. So we would be trying to make the data a little bit more uh, visible to everybody. And we'll be putting our data on the uh, website, on the water sections section. Thank you. Thank you, John. We really appreciate you and Peter and the rest of the team working on this. It's important. Um, and they are working with the county and the state and other agencies. So um, they're, they're kind of really trying to keep tabs of what's going on with our water availability and water resources. So thank you. So next we have Commander Kevin Boast with the Jeff Coe Sheriff's Department. And um, the Sheriff's Department, you know, does so much. I mean, they work with wildfire, um, traffic, crime, and they're definitely a community resource. Um, so Kevin's going to talk about some of those, I think. I'm not good with microphones, so bear with me. So, if I'm loud, I apologize. I just want to introduce myself first and foremost. Uh, my name is Kevin Boss. I am the Mountain Commander for the Jeffco Sheriff's Office. Um, a little bit about me, just so you guys know, um, grew up in Bailey, and so it's, it's an awesome privilege to be the commander of the entire uh, Mountain Division. So, my office is based in Evergreen at our substation. And so, um, I'm there Sunday through Wednesday, generally from 6 to 4 until January, and I'll be 2 p.m. until about midnight, so. But swing by, I'll make sure you guys have my contact information. A couple of things that I plan to talk about real quick are wildfire. Um, sometimes it doesn't seem like it's wildfire season, it's November, and it's pretty cold outside. Um, but we've been working a lot with our uh, fire departments up here and trying to ensure that we try to uh, share a consistent message, and so I'll talk about that in a minute. And then also talk about traffic. Um, obviously, we had a mass casualty traffic accident a few short months ago. And so we'll talk about traffic and the impact we're trying to have on that. And then I'll touch briefly on crime and then on community. And afterwards, please come see me if you have questions. But uh, our campaign this year, um, along with uh, the fire chiefs up here uh, in the entire mountain area, is a campaign that we started called Be Your Own Hero. Um, which is hilarious coming from the sheriff's office and fire departments because a lot of times, uh, especially the fire guys are seen, the gals are seen as the heroes. But what it talks a lot about on here, and I've got handouts back on the table afterwards for everybody. If you haven't seen this, it's also online. And I don't know if you can see on that. There's a couple things that we're really trying to reiterate with uh, the communities. The first one is signing up for Code Red. That is the program that we use to launch when we're trying to tell you to evacuate. 
uh, program, you can list as many phone numbers. You can do your cell phones, you can do your home phone number. It's kind of nice if you do your cell phones because if you're doing evacuation and that cell phone is registered to your house, you're going to get a notification even if you're not home. So they should have an idea of what might be going on. <laughs> Code Red is not just used for wildland fire. We use it for anything that might be a critical incident. So anything that might be a major crime incident going on as well. Um, and great, great piece of information. Um, but when it comes to the fire, our big thing is be your own hero. And what we talk about is don't wait, but evacuate. A lot of times it's waiting for either the fire departments or the sheriff's office to tell people it's, it's time to go. Um, and it's important that it's, you, you don't have to wait for me or fire to tell you. If you guys see smoke, you see fire coming, I guess I can take my mask off and I'm here better. Um, by all means, go ahead and go. Growing up in Bailey, Colorado, I had to evacuate myself several times before the Park County Sheriff's Department or Park County Fire Department can show to our own house. And that's kind of a push that we're trying to, to let everybody know. On this next one. Um, the big other thing is get ready, get set, and go early. When it's time to evacuate, there's five P's that we are trying to push into memory. Um, and that is to they always include people and pets. So the last thing you want to do is evacuate and leave somebody behind. Uh, that, that's not good. So it's always people and pets. A lot of another thing a lot of people forget about is prescriptions. Uh, fire can cause you to be away from your residence for quite some time, a couple days sometimes, uh, even longer depending on the size of the fire. So if you have life uh, medication that's really important, we always want to stress grab your, your medication, so prescriptions. Any important papers that you might need. If you have them in a safe or you have them in a, in a you know, centrally stored area, you want to grab those. Personal needs, sometimes clothes, change your clothes, maybe some cash, your phones. A lot of them are good to grab your phones, but we forget to grab our chargers. And then priceless items, any heirlooms or anything like that that's you might want in the event that the fire is ultimately destructive and property is lost. I've got a video, I know there's no audio. Um, so, you know, if you got a cool song in your head, just kind of like, Whoa. oh, there it is. And so I know we're in winter months, we come springtime, and that deadfall starts falling down from all that heavy snow that we get in spring. Great opportunity to start pulling some of that away from your property by helping protect your own property. There's a, there's a good chance you might be able to save it from a destructive fire. Uh, there it is, jeffcosheriff.co, B-Y-O-H, green, your own hero, not B-Y-O-B. 
So now you remember BYOH, it's easy. Um, moving on from, from that point, we'll move into traffic because I know time is, is taken here. There's a, been a lot of questions about traffic and how are we impacting um, crashes and speed. 285 has been a problem since I went to school at Black Canyon High School. I used to drive up down 285 myself going to high school. 285 has always been one of the busiest highways. This map behind me here, this is the 285 corridor that's running up. The yellow dots represent uh, property accidents, and then our red dots uh, for our injury crashes that have occurred. You can see everything in green is the mountain division, and then the other two colors they don't have, it, but that's our north and our south precincts. Obviously, we don't have anything marked on there. The 285 corridor is still uh, at the most frequent accident area up here as far as uh, this map shows. And this is just from October, so over the last month. One of the things that we have done in the Sheriff's Office is that we have deployed a couple um, speed capturing devices that capture the speed that is going on frequently throughout the day. So it, it, kept, it captures that information and then we take that information to find out how do we target those areas. I don't want to confuse the word target with we're going to go out and our goal is to absolutely write tickets. Our goal a lot of times is education and trying to slow people down and get that word to spread that word aware. So that's kind of how we try to track that data and impact it. This just shows right here um, for our impact, our traffic unit on the left, and then in our fire control division on the right. And, and combined, about 400 traffic tickets were written last month. Um, that includes our motor officers, and that, control, that includes all my staff that's out there that you see in our SUVs and in our patrol vehicles. Um, so probably there's five, roughly 500. We have a couple different summonses we use. That's why it's in different colors. I won't bore you with that information. But you, there's a lot of stops that occur outside of those citations. And so we're trying to have an impact on that. Real quick, I'll dive into crime. I got one minute. Crime in the mountains um, is a little bit down right now. Crime overall in some areas is up and some crime is down. But right now, in the last month, the three major crimes that we try to pay attention to up here are burglaries, criminal trespass and motor vehicles, and motor vehicle thefts. Uh, in the entire mountain division, in that month of October, not a single motor vehicle was stolen. Um, there was, a, I think, six burglaries total, four residential, two were commercials, and then I think we had four criminal trespasses. Yes, it happens. How, how, do, how do we combat that? How do I ask you guys for your help and spread the word? First and foremost, Please, 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 I encourage everybody to lock your vehicles, lock your houses. Shut your garage doors if you can. A lot of how a crime of opportunity usually occurs. Um, when, when suspects go out, they pull out a car door and it's locked, they generally move on to the next one. Same thing with your front doors. Um, and then the same thing with um, breaking into motor vehicles and then trying to see them. Uh, people are still leaving their keys in their vehicles. Uh, 26 of our, I think it's 48 vehicles down in the South Precinct. They were stolen, uh, the keys were left in the car. And I know about time, real quick on community. I'm a huge community person. I, I cannot um, if, if serve protecting force without a community partnership and working with everybody here. And so I encourage everything I've talked about is community involvement is two ways. We need our community members to talk to your neighbors. You guys know what's in the community better than I do. Um, and work with us, work with fire as the best as we can. If you guys see something, say something, it's the big thing that we try to push. Um, when in doubt, always call 911. I promise you none of my staff are ever going to give you a hard time for call 911. So when it comes to community, if you see something, please, please, please say something and let us know. We'll chase 100 calls of nothing and for that one call that is something. So I'll be around in the back somewhere afterwards if you got questions. Thank you, Kevin. That was great information. So after the last um, town hall meeting in September, um, there was a lot of talk on the social media sites and everything about urgent, an urgent care facility and safety. Um, we have, Conifer Area Council has done several surveys, comprehensive surveys over the years, one in 2006, 2010, 14, and 18. And the last two specifically um, showed that urgent care was really, really, really an important thing for the community members. We had studied it back in 2014 and found um, that it wasn't the time, um, we didn't have the 
um, base, the population base. Um, but we decided it was time to study it again. So we um, formed a study action team on urgent um, care facilities. And um, Katie Rothman, who is a um, Conifer Area Council board member and on that team, is going to give a little bit of report. I believe that you also have information in your packets about our findings on this. Katie? After the September Town Hall meeting, the Conifer Area Council made a commitment to research urgent care facilities as identified as a priority in our community. According to a 2018 survey by Pew Research Center, rural Americans are less likely than the people in urban areas to have easy access to doctors and hospitals. Rural Americans live an average of 10.5 miles from the nearest hospital compared to 5.6 in the suburban areas and 4.4 of those in the urban areas. Conifer Area Council formed the site action team to research to reach out to our local authorities and conduct internet research on this issue, and here is what we have learned. To be an urgent care facility, there needs to be a required special credentialing. The startup cost for a standalone ER is about $1.5 million. While not credentialed, in the urgent care, but not credentials in urgent care, Conference Medical Center provides some emergency care and is open six days a week. The only holidays it's closed is Thanksgiving. Christmas and New Year's Day. For life threatening emergencies like a heart attack or a head injury, Conifer Medical has to wait for an EMS from the local fire department to transport the patient to a hospital. Chief Ware from Elk Creek Fire said that unless there was a legitimate standalone ER that was linked to a hospital, the department was still needed to transport the patient to a hospital because of strict protocols they must follow. If it's a true emergency, the department would need to bypass a standalone facility for a higher level of care. King Supers, in some locations, has a little clinic open 24 hours a day, but the Conifer Manager Center location was just too small for this kind of service. A standalone ER needs to be profitable for the operator, and it would be difficult to make the profit up here due to cost of land and the lack of sufficient population, according to our sources. Another issue, of course, is staffing, which is already a struggle for the medical community. Standalone ERs are very expensive for the patient. According to a nine news investigation, providers charge a facility fee in addition to a fee for medical care. According to bills analyzed by Nine Wants to Know, UC Health ER, for example, charges a facility fee roughly between $700 and $6,200. According to Journal of Urgent Care Medicine, there's an oversaturation of urgent care facilities in the suburbs. The Urgent Care Association claims that only 6.7% of urgent care facilities are located in rural markets. They speculate that current insurance reimbursement models may not support the cost to operate such staff to operate in staff such centers in sparsely populated rural communities and act as deterrent to urgent care providers. The report states that to break even, most urgent care needs an average of 25 visits a day. One promising note from Urgent Care Association is that some urgent cares in the South are making it work in rural areas, and there is also very preliminary talk of federal subsidies for urgent cares. For everything we've learned, Conifer is not in position for urgent care facility at this time, but if anybody would like to study this further, um, I can definitely provide more information, and I will be around afterwards to talk to you what my sources are and to help you guide where we can look even further into this challenge we have. Thank you, Katie. So um, next, um, Senator Tammy Story um, had another commitment tonight, um, but Representative Lisa Cutter is here, and she's going to do a, a, a legislative update for us. Lisa. Okay. All right, 
thank you so much, Shirley, and thank you uh, all for being here tonight. It's a pleasure to see people. Um, lots going on at the legislature, surprisingly. We're not, um, as you likely know, we're not in session, but we're getting ready to get back. And we've all been really busy um, this summer working on lots of issues to prepare, uh, prepare for our return. So we're expecting a lot of transformational legislation to come out of some task forces um, that have been going on this summer on behavioral health, housing, and e the economy, economic task force, um, to just explore how we can use some of the federal dollars in a way that's really going to make an impact in Colorado for into the future, not just a one-time thing. We really want to change some systems and um, things in an impactful way. So they've been hard at work, and um, I'm eager to, to see the legislation that's coming out of it. We've heard some preliminary reports. Um, I worked on, it, I've talked about this here before, but I my project this summer specifically was the Wildfire, wildfire Interim Committee, and um, it's just a pleasure working with our, our professionals throughout the state that are working to protect um, the wildlife urban interface and all the areas that are at risk and I this one is large looms large on the horizon when we're talking about wildfire and we already heard uh, a lot about that and how important it is the five bills we approved for introduction um, through this whole process of the interim committee we forwarded bills and had to narrow it down to five good bills um, the bipartisan committee selected these bills and voted on them and, and they all passed through leadership so the five bills being approved for introduction will be uh, we'll be working on new, a new funding stream um, this is more a sustainable funding stream that's a state match for communities so that um, if you raise an ongoing create an ongoing commitment to wildfire mitigation we'll um, you'll have the opportunity to get that matched by the state we're really looking at ways that we can leverage dollars and make them last um, you know, going on into the future. Uh, a tax credit for folks mitigating their homes is something that I ran a couple years ago and had to set aside because of COVID and, you know, funding and all the things that were going on. But I'm excited to see that one coming back. It's costly, it's difficult work, and we want to help support the homeowners that are doing that work. Uh, more support for our volunteer firefighters. Um, just like to take a moment now to acknowledge the, the um, firefighter who died in a plane crash um, in execution of his uh, his duties in, in the line of uh, duty on Tuesday night, um, fighting the wildfire in Estes Park. Um, so this just brings home how really important it is. These, these men and women face danger all the time, put aside families, jobs, um, very little um, support in terms of financial resources for our, you know, many, many of our wildlife firefighters are volunteers. So it's really important. I've been working with uh, another, uh, Senator Janal, on um, providing more support for these firefighters, like reimbursement for out-of-pocket expenses, mental health supports, anything that we can do to um, support them and make their jobs and their lives a little easier. That's that's really near and dear to my heart and uh, really brought home by the loss of, of um, that gentleman this week. Uh, we're also looking at soil stabilization and some carbon capture after a fire. There's some best practices around how we can um, promote uh, forest health and regeneration and, and um, you know, soil stabilization. You all know flooding is a big issue after fire. So we'll be running some legislation on that. And then um, increasing public awareness on wildfire danger and the importance of mitigation. And Senator Story is working on that one as well. So um, she's been hard at work and has some great thoughts around that. So we'll invoke her tonight since she can't be with us. Um, I know she's sad she's not here to talk about it herself. Um, other bills, I think one thing that's, um, I'm looking for the timer. <laughs> feels, like, feels like it's been going on for a while, but um, um, just briefly I'll say the other things that, okay, great, awesome. Um, we, today, this week there's a report, I work a lot on zero waste and um, recycling issues, good, good stewardship of our resources, and there was a report this week um, that came out from EcoCycle and Coperg that um, measures the recycling in Colorado, just a holistic look at all the, the things, and we are incredibly behind the curve. I cannot emphasize enough how really big of a problem this is for Colorado. Our recycling rates are about 15%. The nationwide average is 35%. Who wants to be the laggard? This is not okay. We, we believe and feel in our heart that we live in a green state, and we do in many ways, but 
really our, our ideals aren't living up to reality. Our reality isn't living up to our ideals. You get it. So there's a lot of work to do, and I'm really, really committed to this work. Um, we This report is really, oh, the microphone went out. Well, I, can, I can talk loud. Can you all hear me if I just talk about oh, yeah, yeah. Um So good thing I have a voice that carries. So we, um, I'm working with the uh, senator, Republican senator, Senator Priola, this year, this year to um, to introduce uh, a, a producer responsibility legislation, which will make so we as consumers we can't be responsible. You can't live in this world and not have packaging, right? You buy toothpaste and there's three layers of packaging. You, I mean, it's everywhere, and so. We're saying that uh, producers need to have some, the people putting this packaging on their products, they need to have some, bear some responsibility towards um, uh, paying for the cost of recycling this. So we're working with industry to come up with a, um, a plan and a, a nonprofit organization that will collect fees on this packaging and then feed it out back to the communities, back to Conifer, back to Evergreen, back to Littleton, back to the cities and counties so that they have the funds to create infrastructure and have a more consistent recycling system in Colorado. So I'm really, really excited about that. It's always good when the problem is so bad that you there's lots of room for improvement, right? So I'm very excited about that legislation. I'm also working on assistance for food pantries, an ongoing problem um, throughout the pandemic and beyond. Consumer protection, um, a piece of consumer protection legislation for businesses, and um, really a couple of other things, but those are the highlights. I'm always happy to hear from you. Lisa.cutter.house at state.co.us. Please reach out to me if you have any questions or ideas, thoughts, concerns. I appreciate y'all, and it's nice to see you here tonight. Thank you, Lisa. So you've been hearing a lot about wildfire tonight. Um, it's the middle of November, it's freezing outside, and yet there's a fire burning in Estes Park. So we always have to have that on our minds, and we have three people here tonight that are very dedicated to this. Um, we have Captain Van Yellen, we have Captain John Mandel, and we have mi um, mitigation the Wildfire Mitigation Specialist, Kelly McConaughey, here from um, both Inner Canyon and Elk Creek Fire Departments. And they're going to be talking about what we can all do right now and always. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, we won't take up too much of your time. I'm going to talk really fast because all three of us got to get in the time allotted. Um, the three of us here represent two fire districts. Uh, I'm with Inner Canyon. My name is John Mandel. Benjamin Yellen is the wildland captain with Elk Creek, and Kelly McConaughey is actually employed by both Inner Canyon and Elk Creek as a wildland mitigation specialist. Um, but about a year and a half ago, we kind of looked at the hazards of our district and, and realizing that wildfire is the highest hazard that we face, um, we formed a wildland division, and that would allow us to incorporate everything from the wildland standpoint, being training, be it response. Um, be a mitigation under one uh, roof, so to speak, for both districts. Um, so with that, we're able to offer a lot of services. Everything that we're going to talk about here quickly can be found on our website. So if you go to intercanyonfire.org or elkcreekfire.org and you click on the wildland tab on either one of those websites, it's going to take you to the same wildland tab that will have everything and more as far as what we're going to talk about tonight for our programs. So I do encourage you to check that out. Um, I'm going to start off with our chipping program. Hopefully everybody here is familiar with it. If not, again, go to the website and look at it. Um, it is a service where we will come and chip uh, your slash and you leave at the roadside. And that is a uh, service provided for free from the fire district. It was a huge success this year. We had a goal of 600 homes, 600 address points. And um, we succeeded in that and beyond. We had well over 600 address points that we had facilitated uh, this year. Um, we are continuing the program next year, and we're also looking at a little bit of an expansion on our personnel. Um, this year, we had anticipated anticipating running with four personnel. Unfortunately, we lost one early on due to personal reasons, um, and so those 600 added points were accomplished by a short group of three. Um, next year, we actually found money in our budgets to uh, add another seasonal personnel, seasonal person to that, so we will run with a five-person crew next year um, to service everybody as far as their, their slash needs. 
Um, with that, I will turn it over to Captain Young. Hi, good evening, good evening everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Um, many of you might know that we are in a year long, almost more than a year and a half long update of our Community Wildfire Protection Plan. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a collaborative process with all of our stakeholders, land managers, um, county representatives, other fire protection districts, uh, the U.S. Forest Service, and um, the Colorado State Forest Service, and we're really looking at the wildfire landscape. We've heard a lot about that today, uh, but we're putting a lot of analysis into what we really do have on the ground. We've done a lot of mitigation work. We have a lot more to do, um, and the built environment changes a lot of that risk. So what we've done is use a company called the Ember Alliance, who are specialists in this area. Um, they've run a lot of GIS modeling that we will make public as soon as it is um, done. It's all going to be again on the website. There will be a plan and then tools alongside those for everybody to use. What it's really going to do is make, make a lot of sense for how we move forward. We have a lot of tools within the division um, that's going to prioritize those tools and then it's going to give us a work plan to move forward at a watershed, fire district, and neighborhood level. Um, and then we have those tools for the homeowners as well. So it's really going to help us have a good lens on what we need to be doing in the next 10 years. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you in the same room um, December 7th because it is a public process. So in order for it to be a really effective plan, we do need your feedback and input. So please join us at 630 uh, right here on December 7th. Um, we'll get really in the weeds on everything, and you can come see some of the products that we've worked on uh, for the last year and a half. Um, it really does allow for us to position ourselves with a lot of the funding going on at the state and federal level to vie for those funds, and then really figure out how to prioritize those and have a work plan moving forward. So please attend. Um, we'd love your input. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kelly. Um, the program I'm going to talk about, um, that we, another program we offer within Elk Creek Inner Canyon, is our Community Ambassador Program. So the Community Ambassadors are, you can really think of them as like your direct link, your line of communication to the fire protection districts within your neighborhoods. Um, so all of those community ambassadors, they do receive specialized training, and that training is something that they can take back to their neighborhoods and apply towards um, mitigation education efforts. So something that that ambassador program also provides is um, really being able to support neighborhoods when it comes to wildfire risk and wildfire mitigation. Um, those community ambassadors are also able to take a lot of the information and the tools that we're going to provide with the CWPP and apply it to their neighborhoods. Um, Anybody who wants to find their community ambassador within their neighborhood can go to our website and you can find your neighborhood and locate your ambassador. If you don't have an ambassador within your neighborhood, we do encourage you, if you're um, willing and motivated, if you want to apply for that process, you can. You can go to the website and you can contact me. Um, with that process, it, um, all of our ambassadors are considered volunteers for the department, so they do go through a background process, but our volunteer ambassadors are not required to go through um, the actual fire academy. So again, all that information, uh, every program that we have discussed today is all stuff that you can find on our website, and then contact information for myself as well. Thank you so much. You know, I was part of the chipping program last year. Um, my husband and I it took us, you know, a month, month and a half to cut down the trees and get the slash all moved to 15 piles. And these guys came in, they were amazing. Absolutely amazing. I wasn't even there that day, but when I came home, you'd never know that we had 15 piles of slash piled up in our driveway. So thank you so much. You guys are great. <laughs> So, um, okay, so last but not least, we have Leslie Dompenner, our commissioner, and um, she's just going to give a little bit of an update um, for Jefferson County. Leslie. Thank you. Thanks, Shirley. Hi, everyone. How are you doing tonight? It's so good to see you. I'm just going to just go. I'm going to here. Now, 
Scott. And um, just a couple of additional comments. Uh, also on the board of the head of the board of county commissioners, we want to extend our, our deepest sympathies to uh, Pilot Olson, whom you heard Representative Cutter refer to uh, earlier, uh, just a moment ago. It, it really does bring home the seriousness of this work and the work that uh, firefighters, our deputies, and others, our first responders, who are on the scene immediately to keep our community safe. So we thank you all. For the work that you do. I also would like to mention that I serve on the Colorado Fire Commission. We're doing some very interesting work that I think is especially relevant to share with you. Governor Polis, uh, a couple of months ago, tasked the WUI Committee, which is one of the subcommittees of the Colorado Fire Commission, to look at growth and development in the wildland urban interface, which is particularly of interest to us in Jefferson County, since we rank number one in the state for property damage due to uh, wildfire. And we're looking at issues around growth and development. How do we do that responsibly in the wildland urban interface? How do we look at everything from defensible, uh, defensible space to building codes and much more? So we'll be sure to keep you up to date. We're looking at everything from education to planning and zoning uh, to regulations, policy, and much more. So. We're not quite halfway through that process, but it has been a very good discussion and it will have implications not only for Jefferson County, but statewide as well. So uh, I hope you know that you have a good team uh, between our amazing uh, firefighters and uh, fire rescue districts to the Sheriff's Department to um, Representative Cutter and Tammy Story serving on the Wildfire Matters and the Colorado Fire Commission. Really proud to represent to be one of two county commissioners statewide serving on that committee. I have a question for you tonight. How many of you are over COVID-19, are just tired and weary of this pandemic? I was listening to a Board of Health meeting until 11.15 last night. And uh, there were a lot of good people across the community with very different perspectives on strategies moving forward to tamp down on our uh, skyrocketing COVID-19 case count. And um, I'll share with you in a moment what the Board of Health decided to do at the end of that meeting. But first, let me just share some numbers with you. Take my glasses off so I can actually uh, read some of this data I wanted to share. As many of you know, you've seen the headlines. We've seen uh, skyrocketing cases of COVID across uh, not just Jetco, but Colorado, a steep increase in rates. Let me just share this data point with you, because this hit home with me. Uh, the Jetco Public Health Director addressed the Board of County Commissioners just yesterday, and she told us that in July, our seven-day incidence rate of new COVID cases was 23 per 100,000 residents. July, 23, 100,000 per residents, 100,000 it's now climbed up to 300 per 100,000 residents. The rates are the highest among 5 to 11 year olds. The good news, though, is that the vaccine is now available for those 5 to 11 year olds. The bad news is that Jefferson County, out of all the counties in Colorado, has the second highest hospitalization rate due to COVID as well. How many of you are vaccinated or have gotten your booster shot? Just got my booster shot and my flu shot. Don't forget about your flu shot as well. And it really is an added layer of protection. And I just want to take a moment to thank all of you in our community who are wearing your masks, who are getting your vaccination, who are just uh, being safe around others at this time. The Board County Commissioners also yesterday approved our county budget. Uh, as you know, we've had some budget challenges over the last couple of years, including some pretty major cuts to our budget, including a budget cuts of $16 million in 2020 and another $8.7 million in 2021. There were no cuts planned for uh, the 2022 budget, the budget we approved yesterday, but we are anticipating about $14 to $16 million in cuts in 2023, and that is due um, largely to legislation that was passed to uh, help address concerns about a ballot initiative that failed, but it would have significantly lowered uh, property taxes. Of course, that is the main source of revenue for the general revenue fund to provide the county services and, and programs as well. And last but not least, if you are interested in hearing more about what we're doing with the county budget, with American Rescue Plan dollars, 
um, how we are allocating those dollars, what our priorities are, what our priorities are from behavioral health to affordable housing to workforce development and much more. We will be holding a telephone town hall that's going to be on December 6th at 5.30 and you can visit our website at jeffco.us. Just go to our homepage and scroll down and, and uh, you can just click on the information and join our town, telephone town hall. Ask any questions, any issues that are on your mind, you can share those with us. Of course, you can always reach out to all three of us at commish at jeffco.us and you can reach out to me directly at ldahlkem, L-D-A-H-L-K-E-M, at jeffco.us. Dahlkem was apparently too long to fit in the email <laughs> address. So, um, And then last but not least, I do want to give a big shout out to our Jeffco staff, 3,000 incredible employees, um, whether it's human services, whether it's the Jeffco Sheriff's Department, our road and bridge crew, we have faced major challenges in terms of labor shortages. You heard Shirley mention that earlier. Our planning and zoning department um, is really spread thin right now. And uh, the pandemic on top of it has really required our staff to be more creative and innovative than ever before. So just a special shout out to them uh, for their incredible hard work and a huge thank you to you, our community, for all that you do as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie. So that's it for tonight. Um, I want to again um, do a shout out for um, for both Christy and Tiffany with Remax Alliance for their community support tonight, um, and also Sharon Trilk um, for videotaping the meeting, which will there will be a link um, in the next couple days so that you can watch it again or you can tell everybody else to watch it, which would be great. Um, I think the last time we had about 300 um, people watching. Um, after the meeting, so I think it's really beneficial. Um, the next meeting will be uh, for the town hall meeting will be February 16th, on a Wednesday night, a um, couple three months from now. So, gosh, happy holidays! Thank you for coming. Um, hope we see you around the holidays at all of the Christmas festivities. Thank you.